Welcome to the fourth video in my Countering the Kalam series. In this final video, I'm going to show how the Kalam is a circular argument and relies on a discredited and unfalsifiable scientific theory. Now, if you can remember back to my previous videos in the series, then you know that the Kalam cosmological argument relies on the notion of absolute simultaneity and the tensed or A theory of time both being true in order for the argument to even get off the ground. This is because in order to avoid acting before the beginning of time, God's act of creation must be absolutely simultaneous with the creation of all space and time. As for the A theory, this is admitted by Dr. Craig to quote, From start to finish, the Kalam cosmological argument is predicated upon the A theory of time. On a B theory of time, the universe does not in fact come into being or become actual at the Big Bang. It just exists tenselessly as a four-dimensional space-time block that is finitely extended in the earlier-than direction if time is tenseless, then the universe never really comes into being, and, therefore, the quest for a cause of its coming into being is misconceived. The problem here is that Einstein's special relativity provides very strong evidence that the simultaneity of events is always relative, and that absolute simultaneity is impossible. It actually also shows that time is tenseless since there is no privileged reference frame that would make time absolute. This is something that Einstein himself realized in his book, Relativity, to quote, Since there exists in this four-dimensional structure, space-time, no longer any sections which represent now objectively, the concepts of happening and becoming are indeed not completely suspended, but yet complicated. It appears, therefore, more natural to think of physical reality as a four-dimensional existence instead of, as hitherto, the evolution of a three-dimensional existence. Now, since special relativity underpins almost all of modern physics, this is a pretty fatal problem for the Kalam. And to get around it, Dr. Craig endorses what's known as the Neo-Lorentzian view of space and time, and that espouses the existence of a privileged reference frame, or what scientists before Einstein called the luminiferous ether. Now, the scientist Hendrik Lorentz was a contemporary of Einstein and was committed to the idea of the motionless ether. He rejected the idea of space-time as a manifold, and the idea that the ether did not exist. The problem for him was that special relativity works, and it actually has a wealth of evidence to back it up. So Lorentz went back and reworked his theory, eventually getting it to be mathematically equivalent to the equations for Einstein's special relativity. But in order to do this, he had to leave the ether as a metaphysical idea that was undetectable in principle. This means that not only is there no evidence for the existence of a privileged reference frame, we can never have evidence for it, leaving the theory unfalsifiable and hence unscientific. The problem is that explaining exactly why the Neo-Lorentzian view is so absurd involves some fairly technical material in physics. I'm going to try and simplify the issues to make it more understandable, but I'm going to link to more information on each area so that any viewer can examine the science to verify for themselves that what I'm saying is correct. You can also check my blog for more detailed explanation on all of these points. To get started, you have to understand the uncontroversial relativity principle. This is actually something that you experience every day and probably don't even realize it. Imagine there are two people in a transparent train car, and the train is moving at 100 miles an hour. Person A and Person B decide to race from the back of the car to the front, so they're running in the same direction that the train is moving. Let's say Person B is a little bit faster than Person A. Person A can run at 5 miles an hour, and Person B can run at 7 miles an hour. From Person A's point of view, or frame of reference, Person B is moving faster than them, but not by much only two miles an hour. However, imagine if person C was standing on the side of the tracks and watches this race as the train goes by. From that frame of reference, it will look like both people in the train are going really fast at 105 and 107 miles an hour. However, notice the difference in speed between person A and person B is still only two miles an hour, even though they both look like they're going so much faster to person C compared to each other. This is relativity. How fast each person looks like they're moving is relative to how fast the observer is moving. Each observer has its own frame of reference in this way. However, we know by experiment that the laws of physics, including the laws of motion, don't really change if you're going at different speeds. Force still equals mass times acceleration no matter how fast you're going. This is known as invariance. 
Since things can look different depending on an observer's reference frame, we use certain types of equations to transform a description of one physical system from one reference frame to another. Before Einstein, in classical Newtonian physics, the transformation used was called a Galilean transformation, so the laws of motion were known as being Galilean invariant. Now if the Neo-Lorentzian interpretation of special relativity is correct, then space and time are absolute and Galilean invariance should be true for physics. What Einstein found in special relativity was that to transition between reference frames you have to use a Lorentz transformation, meaning that the laws of physics should be Lorentz invariant, not Galilean invariant. When you combine that with the assumption that the speed of light in a vacuum is constant, that's the letter C in the famous equation E equals mc squared, it means that space and time are not absolute and actually deform based on velocity or motion. What we found by experiment was that Einstein was correct. Space and time are actually Lorentz invariant and they deform the closer you get to the speed of light or when you have a position relative to a large enough mass. Galilean transformations only work if you stay well below the speed of light and once you start getting close to that speed it simply doesn't work anymore. This is proven by the phenomenon of time dilation and length contraction. Special relativity predicts both of these deformations of space-time, and we've since been able to verify both of them through a variety of scientific experiments. Basically, if you move really fast, close to the speed of light, the length of an object decreases as space-time warps around it, and basically that's known as length contraction. Similarly, if you move really fast, close to the speed of light, or are situated further away from a large mass, then space-time warps and time actually slows down. That's called time dilation, and we actually use this and account for it every day as the atomic clocks in our GPS satellites that are identical to the atomic clocks here on Earth, they actually tick slower once they're in space above the Earth. Now, Dr. Craig and other Neil Lorentzian proponents will claim that both time dilation and length contraction don't actually happen in reality, they merely appear to happen and that motion near the speed of light merely obscures our measurement instruments, despite the fact that we have multiple independent empirical tests that show that both of these phenomena actually happen to the best of our observational abilities. In fact, you can see Dr. Craig complain about the verificationist assumptions of scientists who favor the Minkowski four-dimensional space-time interpretation that pr actually predict length contraction and time dilation. I just kind of want to highlight the difference here. The Minkowski interpretation predicts a phenomenon in the theory, and we actually observe that phenomenon in reality, whereas the Neo Lorentzian interpretation does not predict this phenomenon and has to come up with some kind of ad hoc explanation as to why it only appears to happen but doesn't actually happen in reality. However, it should be pointed out that we don't just have experimental evidence to disprove what Dr. Craig is saying, we actually have a strong theoretical basis for doing so as well. For that, we can thank the laws of electromagnetism and the great scientist James Clark Maxwell. That's the guy we named Maxwell's equations after. Maxwell's equations showed us two important things that led to Einstein developing special relativity. First, it showed that one of the assumptions of special relativity is true, that C, the speed of light in a vacuum, was a constant. This is because even before we knew that that particular constant was the speed of light, back then it was just a property of electromagnetism that had to be a constant for mathematical consistency in Maxwell's equations. Eventually, Maxwell realized that light was a form of electromagnetic radiation, and we found out that this constant represented what it does. The second thing that Maxwell's equations showed us was that the laws of electromagnetism could only be Lorentz invariant. In fact, it shows that the Galilean invariance required by the Neo-Lorentzian view cannot possibly be applied to electromagnetism. It breaks the equations. This means that if the Neo-Lorentzian view was correct, there'd be a fundamental contradiction in physics between the laws of motion and the laws of electromagnetism. This, combined with all the experimental evidence, and the evidence from the Michelson-Morley experiment, which failed to detect any presence of the luminiferous ether, is the main reason why modern physics rejects the Neo-Lorentzian interpretation and goes with the Minkowski four-dimensional space-time interpretation of Einstein's special relativity. 
Dr. Craig knows there's no evidence for the Neo-Lorentzian view and that modern science rejects that interpretation of special relativity. So in response, he turns up his rhetoric about scientism or verificationist assumptions. Now, despite his indignation against people who dare want to verify scientific theories with reality, Dr. Craig sure got very excited when the scientists at CERN might have found particles traveling faster than the speed of light, which would invalidate special and general relativity. He put up an article on his website going on about how Lorentz had been vindicated. Now, unfortunately for Dr. Craig, the scientists at CERN found out that it was a bogus experiment because of a loose fiber optic cable and that general relativity still holds. In a final ditch effort to make the Neo Lorentzian view seem more appealing, Dr. Craig likes to point to the now empirically established EPR paradox in quantum mechanics that highlights a tension between Bell's theorem and Einstein's relativity. This is an actual problem in modern physics where a direct contradiction between relativity and the laws of quantum mechanics is avoided only by a technicality. Science is actually actively looking for something to truly unify these two well-established theories. Dr. Craig likes to point out that if the neo lorentzian view was adopted, the EPR paradox would be resolved. The problem for him is that this isn't the only potential solution to the problem, and not all solutions require a privileged reference frame or absolute simultaneity. String theory is currently one of the most promising solutions advocated in science, which, if it was successful, would provide a unified theory of everything in physics, describing everything from the smallest particles to the largest objects in our cosmos and it wouldn't suffer the explanatory deficiencies the Neo Lorentzian view has. The reason we don't just accept string theory and its extra seven or more dimensions of space-time is the exact same reason we don't accept the Neo Lorentzian view and its privileged reference frame. There's currently no empirical evidence for its existence, and there aren't even any experimental tests to verify that the theory is true. Science requires empirical data to validate a theory because without it, you can always add unfalsifiable conjecture to any theory to get any set of results that you wanted. So why would philosophers like William Lane Craig endorse a theory that, one, is much more complex to explain all of the available data supporting special relativity, two, asserts the existence of an unnecessary and undetectable preferred reference frame, the ether, that we have absolutely no scientific evidence for, Three, accepts that the principle of relativity, as well as the Lorentz invariance of the laws of physics, is true for every other re reference frame, aside from the ether, purely by accident. And four, accept a theory that has less explanatory power than its competing theory. Well, William Lane Craig gives us the answer in his book, The Tenseless Theory of Time. To quote Dr. Craig, the tenseless theory is theologically objectionable, since its claim that God and the universe coexist tenselessly is incompatible with a robust doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Similarly, in his book Time and the Metaphysics of Relativity, Craig states, We have good reasons for believing that the neo lorentzian theory is correct, namely the existence of God in a theoretic time implies it, so that concerns about which version is simpler become of little moment. So, there you have it. We can accept the neo lorentzian theory of space and time because we believe in the Christian dogma that God exists and that he created the universe without a material cause, out of nothing. And we need this neo lorentzian theory so the Kalam cosmological argument can be used to supposedly prove the existence of a God that created the universe out of nothing. I hope everybody can see exactly how devastating this information is to the Kalam as an argument for the existence of God. But I want to be clear, this information doesn't disprove the existence of a god. No one can prove a negative. But it does contradict the Christian dogma of God creating the universe out of nothing. In fact, with the tenseless theory of time, space-time existing as a four-dimensional structure, it supports the notion that some form of material reality always existed, which is consistent with modern materialist accounts of the creation of our space-time universe, including the quantum nucleation theory, which I talked about earlier, that only needs quantum energy and the laws of quantum mechanics to have always existed. Now, nothing stops a generic theist from saying that God still had a hand in creation, even if some form of material reality always existed. This just makes God's supposed involvement unnecessary to explain the origin of the universe. And much like with special relativity, you can always layer on unnecessary and unfalsifiable conjecture to any theory to get the result you want. 
there's just no evidence for doing so. So that's going to conclude this video series, and I really hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, there's a lot of technical details involved here, and there was a lot I had to leave out. So if you'd like to see this explanation fleshed out a bit more, I encourage you to visit my blog where I'll have some more detailed information posted. Thanks for watching.